another example of this is found in the most popular form of, um, for, for arias um, and an Italian opera seria, which became the most important type of opera that was at the beginning of the 18th century. And that was the form that's known as da capo aria. And what would happen in a da capo aria is that you would have an opening section that all was based on one idea. But then there was a second section that had a contrasting uh, key. And you would have a contrasting theme. But at the end of that section, then they would just write into the score da capo. And then the opening section would be played again. So it was a ternary form. And when that da capo then um, was performed, the, the singer would give a virtuosic embellishment of the return. And so it became a, a type of, of um, vehicle that was abused by singers who were wanting to show off what they could do as, as far as the virtuosity of their, of their voice. And um, the kind of exploitation of that led at the beginning of the classical period to then a revolt against it and what was called opera reform. And it was a kind of a return to the ideals at the very beginning of the growth, which was that music should just be serving the meaning, you know, the, the purpose of expressing the meaning of, of the text. So that basic idea is something which um, is a continual debate of what's the appropriate approach to writing music. And we see that in the 19th century with um, the music of the future versus the more conservative uh, approach by someone like Brahms. So um, that's, that's another general trend that kind of uh, creates a sense of, of, uh, of tension. All right, so I'll put here Da Capo, Aria. style is very dramatic. Um, and very um, often theatrical. It's um, a, a type of um, dramatic emotionalism, though, that is geared toward either glorifying God or glorifying a monarch. So it's not so much of the glorification of the individual composer. So So an example of, of this first type of, of music being a, a vehicle um, that was a direct representation of the glory of God is the, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. example of the second type of glorifying the monarch would be the music of Lully, who was the court composer for Louis XIV, the Sun King, who was the longest reigning monarch in Europe. He was on the throne for 72 years. And so Lully was writing um, French opera, which featured um, stories based on mythology. And so these um, um, gods um, in, in, the, uh, in the plot of the opera, Louis XIV would identify with them and view himself. And in fact, Louis XIV would take part in these productions. 
was, was a great dancer. And, um, so, but that was the, the purpose of, of the music, was to, to glorify uh, the king. So, we're going to put this, this is an emotionalism though, that's in opposition to the 19th century style. So that's another another aspect of the Baroque. So a concept that arose together with tonality was the concept of tonal architecture, which was something that was used to organize instrumental music. And so it's basically, I've already talked about this, but basically the idea that uh, music would be organized according to a tonal scheme, a tonal form, the most basic of which was tonic, dominant, tonic. So those are the two most basic plans for that. So in the 17th century feature a rise in the amount of instrumental music that was being composed. Some more features have to do with the idea of having more indications as far as general performance directions. So we're going to see the use of what's called terraced dynamics, which is basically presenting just different dynamic levels like forte or piano. And so you don't have the idea of crescendo and diminuendo yet. It was more just in kind of blocks. Um, and so that's where that term terrace comes from. And so this um, way that um, composers are starting to write directions in the music is going to continue in classical and in romantic. All right. By the 1650 or so, the composers start to write bar lines into the music, which then indicates a general meter and general pulse. And it was originally just something that was an aid in being able to um, sight read. But that's something too that develops at this point. So, one of the most important types of instrumental music that arose in the 17th century is the concerto. And so this is the next genre that we're going to um, talk about. Yes? Uh, under tonal architecture, yeah. would modes be part of that? Or is that a different thing? Would modes? Yeah, that's a different thing. So, okay. yeah, 
what do you say modes then you're you're implying church modes and so that has to do more with a um, linear view of music and it's, it's a polyphonic view of things but not thinking in terms of chord progressions or of dominant harmonies or tonal chord progressions so that's something that's um, new at the beginning of the baroque what renaissance composers were doing was thinking in terms of intervals that were created when two voices would intersect. And so they were thinking more in terms of intervals rather than vertical combinations of triads and seven chords. So when you say modes, then you're, you're implying that it's in a pre baroque style. All right, so this next section on concerto has to do with instrumental music. types of Baroque concertos, either a solo concerto or what was called a concerto grosso. And the concerto grosso is something that by the end of the 17th century, the most important composer to establish that type was Corelli. And that then becomes um, really, really popular, but the first work that we're going to look at, the Brandenburg Fifth Concerto of Bach, is an example of a concerto grosso. It has a solo group. So, let's write here. So, <clears throat> I talked about antiphonal already that has to do with alternating bodies of sound. And so you have two different um, bodies that are in conversation and dialogue. And so that's the idea of the concerto, is like this inspired dialogue that unfolds between the orchestra and the soloist or solo group. And this type of writing first arose in Venice. So I'm going to write down a couple of terms here. This term concertato is a term that is synonymous with antiphonal. So if you talk about the concertato style, then you're talking about an antiphonal style of writing. Sometimes you see, so I'll just put there equal, sometimes you see the, the term concertant, and that's also the same as concertato. But don't get that mixed up with continuo, because they're very similar, you know. Um, so these have to do with this antiphonal style of writing. Continuo has to do with the players who realize a figure bass. So the style of writing first arose in Venice, and it was associated with the composer Gabrielli. And he was the choir master, cantor, um, at St. Mark's Basilica, St. Mark's Cathedral. And that's, and it's this magnificent structure that has an architectural plan that is based on a cross. So you basically have this with the altar up here and this unique structure of this cathedral had places where choirs could be placed on opposing sides 
so that the composer wrote works in which there was an alternating um, effect between the two choirs. And that there are sometimes there are even a group of instrumentalists who would be up near the altar. And so it had the stereo effect, and it became really, really popular, the style of writing. This type of music now is still really popular with brass choir concerts. So like we have a, a neat setup in our performance hall because groups can be placed on either side of the balcony and you have that music which has that alternation of sound based on the spatial characteristics of that um, performance hall. So, Giovanni Gabrielli is an important Italian composer who was writing in Venice um, for music to be performed in the St. Mark's Cathedral. And this style of music is, is described as the Venetian polychoral style. And so this was the beginning of antiphonal effects in music. And the concerto then naturally grew out of this style of writing. All right, so. They basically had these two types of concerto which had developed, and the concerto grosso is the one that I want to talk about first. They both had the characteristic of having an orchestra in conversation with a soloist or solo group. The orchestra was called Ripiano. So Ripiano means full. And then in Concerto Grosso, <clears throat> this would use a group of soloists that were called the concertina. So that's another term that's kind of like concertante or concertato, and it's, it's related to concerto. All these terms are similar, continuo, it's got to keep them all straight. So if you say concertino, then you're referring to then the group of soloists in a Perot concerto grosso. That's what the concerto featured, was this, this conversation between these two um, groups. And there was a type of...